We had a whole bunch of people request either Aceratopsid or Triceratops specifically. When HV Geek, is his nickname, his real name is Max, visited us in July, he gave me this Triceratops. So we're going to talk about Triceratops today for all of you. Triceratops is one of the basic dinosaurs that everybody learns about in addition to Tyrannosaurus and Stegosaurus and, and them. It's really popular mostly by proxy, I think, because it's usually portrayed with the, the, the bad guy being Tyrannosaurus and, and Triceratops is the peaceful herbivore in, in the predation scenario. This is another one of the 19th century dinosaurs. It was found in 1887 and some remains in 1888 by John Bell Hatcher, who also discovered Taurosaurus. Uh, it was described a couple years later by Othniel Charles Marsh, We have a, quite a bit of material, especially heads, especially skulls, of three-horned, what's called chasmosaurine ceratopsids from the Maastrichtian stage of, of the Cretaceous period in Western North America. O.C. Marsh named eight different genera based on, based on that material. And that tradition continued up until we had 10 genera and 22 species of three-horned dinosaurs from that stage. We have now narrowed it down to just Triceratops and Taurosaurus, both of which have two species apiece. Triceratops has Horridus, which has somewhat curvier brow horns, um, a longer beak slash snout area, which is called the rostrum, and a shorter nose horn, whereas Prorsus, the other uh, species, has a shorter rostrum, a longer nose horn, and these well, straighter, basically, uh, uh, brow horns. I am inclined to think that this one is a Horridus because just based on the way it is posed and the, the way the frill looks, I think it is pretty definitely based on this Charles Knight painting that he made for the Smithsonian. And the Smithsonian specimen is a composite, but as far as I know, it's a composite of all material that has been subsequently assigned to Horridus. Being from the Maastrichtian stage, which is a hard word to say if you're an English speaker because it uses the phlegm consonant, we know that this was at the very, very end of the Cretaceous period. The Triceratops actually only lived for two million years, uh, from 68 to 66 million years ago. It probably died out in the, the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event. So this was one of the last genre of one of the last, if not the last, major clade of dinosaurs to emerge. The ceratopsids are fairly young. They're sort of like the pachycephalosaurs, which is appropriate because they're very closely related to the pachycephalosaurs. They're both grouped into Margina cephalia, whose most recent common ancestor appears to have been in the Jurassic period. The thing that sets ceratopsids apart is not, as the name would imply, their horned faces, it is a bone in the front of their head called the rostral bone. Um, all Ornithischia have the predental bone, which is why they're sometimes called predentata, but ceratopsids also have a bone on top of the predental bone, um, which we couldn't call pre-pre-maxilla because that sounds silly, so um, I believe it was Marsh himself named it the rostral bone. They're the only animal in the animal kingdom that has that bone. Ceratopsids are further divided into two clades, um, one of which is the centrosaurines, which generally are a little bit smaller, have smaller frills with bigger fringe elements on the, the frills, uh, like horns sprouting out of them. Uh, they have bigger nose horns and smaller brow horns, and in profile view, their snouts are squarer 
Whereas the chasmosaurines, which are sometimes called uh, uh, ceratopsines, have a more wedge-shaped head, a larger frill, large brow horns, small uh, uh, nose horn, and generally were larger in size. As a late Cretaceous dinosaur, by now you'll notice the trend is it was very big and very strange looking. Triceratops was approximately the size of an elephant. The weight estimate is right spot on for an elephant. Uh, it was longer, obviously, because it has this long tail that elephants don't have, and because its skull was enormous. It had a 10-foot skull on a 30-foot animal. As far as the posture of this toy, sometimes you'll see Triceratops and, and other chasmosaurines restored with the tail straight out, like you would see with basically any other dinosaur, uh, and more specifically with a centrosaurine. The sacrum, which is the part of the vertebrae that's fused to, to form the, the hip, was twice as long. It contained twice the number of vertebrae that you would usually expect uh, uh, from a dinosaur sacrum. And it was curved. It was curved uh, convex. It was curved upwards. Which tells us that either it would hold its tail straight out and have sort of a stair step thing happening with the spine in the back, but that looks uncomfortable and doesn't seem to work very well if you want to walk. So we're usually restoring it with the, the classic bell curve that I would usually uh, uh, disagree with. But the tails on chasmosaurines and ceratopsids in, in general were usually kind of atrophied, which is to say they were smaller than you would expect in a dinosaur. They had stopped using them for balance because they were what's called obligate quadrupeds because their heads were so frickin' heavy that they just had to walk on all fours. So the tail didn't serve as much purpose anymore, so it, it didn't have to be so big. All of which should tell you that this tail is too long. It's also too skinny and rat-like. Not that it would be using it for very much, but it definitely should be more muscular than this, which of course would make it look even stubbier. They've given it a sort of elephantine posture in the, the spine area. The highest point past the frill, of course, is, is the hip, which is not accurate for this guy. There's a, a strong arch to the spine, such that the highest point is about halfway through the um, dorsal vertebrae, which means that instead of a concave back like you would see on well, most large mammals, ceratopsids had a, a convex back. The elephant comparisons don't stop there because we have to talk about the legs. The back legs on ceratopsids were more similar to ornithopods or pachycephalosaurs than they would be to an elephant or a thyreophorin ornithischian. Thyreophorins being the Ankylosauria, the Stegosauria, and their relatives. Which means that giving it this enormous fleshy pad with really stubby nails on the front of it, like an elephant would have, is not accurate. It would, it would have a classical dinosaur-looking footprint. The innermost three toes were for walking on, and the fourth toe doesn't seem to have been, but it did touch the ground. And we know that because we have trackways from, from ceratopsids, and I believe we have trackways from triceratops specifically, or at least we think it was left by a triceratops. Post-cranial remains for triceratops and for, for most ceratopsids are not as common as we would like, especially considering how many skulls we have. Based on the trackways and based on the way that their bones articulate, we can reasonably conclude that it wouldn't have this sort of A-frame stance with its hind legs. It, it would, its knees would um, poke out a little bit. It was maybe a little bit uh, bow-legged, but the feet were definitely underneath the hip socket, especially while it was walking. The forelimbs were a subject of debate for, for quite a few years, decades, really. For most of the 20th century, we were restoring ceratopsids and especially triceratops with this completely sprawled posture on its front limbs like it was a lizard or something. 
More recently, we started seeing restorations with a fully upright uh, front leg stance, which would allow it to walk around like a rhinoceros, essentially. It would allow it to, to gallop and, and such like, and be this new active triceratops, which is exciting. But based on the trackway evidence that I mentioned earlier, and based on the way that their bones have to articulate together, Currently, the thinking is that it was a sort of semi-sprawled front limb posture. The hands on this guy couldn't pronate all the way down like you would see with a thyreophorin, which sounds weird, but remember that ceratopsids are only recently, phylogenetically speaking, quadrupedal. They're descended from animals that were either facultative bipeds, which is to say they could walk on two legs if they needed to, or obligate bipeds like the pachycephalosaurs. The practical upshot of that is that when its forelimbs were in contact with the ground, they were further apart than its hind limbs were, and they didn't walk on as much of a pad. It was sort of a, a ornithopod forelimb writ large. With the, It was a very wide pad, but not very deep and it, it formed almost a sauropod-looking C. The first three fingers were for walking on, and the, the last two, it had five fingers in total on its front paw. The last two didn't have claws at all. They seemed kind of useless, really. Now, having that semi-sprawled front limb posture seems like it would be a pretty awkward way to move around and that it would limit the animal's speed. Some people have reached that conclusion, Others have pointed out that its shoulder was probably pretty mobile, as, well, at least by dinosaur standards. It had nothing on a mammal. But just because it didn't have its hands directly under its shoulders doesn't mean it couldn't move in a hurry if it had to. Its forelimbs were also a little more proportionally thick and robust compared to the, the ones that they've put on this toy. And the reason they were robust is to support that massive head. The thing to remember about ceratopsid heads is that generally, when you look at them in profile view, underneath all of the beak and horn and frill, you should still be able to see the, the archosaur lines. And this is not represented in this particular toy. The, it's a very squashed front to back skull on him, and, and the neck is just sort of part of the body, which is not accurate. It, it had a thick neck with a, a lot of muscle in there. there. There's a study that you may have seen that the neck muscle was the, the preference for tyrannosaurs while, while eating a triceratops, which means that we have evidence that they ripped the heads off of these carcasses in order to eat the, the succulent neck muscles. So give it neck muscles or the, the toy tyrannosaurus will starve. The beak on ceratopsids is usually compared to a parrot's beak. Its operating principle is rather different, but superficially it definitely resembles one. That's why we have one of the early ceratopsids, it's called Cetacosaurus, which means parrot lizard. The brow horns are a little too high of an angle. They should be at about a, a 60 degree angle from the rest of the skull, and they would curve forwards, uh, uh, both looking at them from the side and from overhead, they would curve forwards. In some specimens, we even see a recurve at the tip, which might be a result of the way that their horns grew as they matured. Uh, we'll talk about ontogeny later, but when they were young, their horns were either straight out or even sharply curved backwards. Um, and then as they reached maturity, they grew forwards. So maybe that recurve is a, is a result of that. The nose horn should be roughly parallel with the brow horns as well. It's usually restored as this sort of right angle to them, but that's not accurate. It would, they, all the horns face basically the same way on Triceratops. Triceratops sometimes gets restored with other horns as well, or at least other projections on the skull covered in, in horn, which is keratin. There's usually these two sticking off of the, the jugal bone, which are called epijugals. Um, 
and there's a bunch of little ones around the edge of the frill, which are called epiparietals or episquamosals. And another interesting thing about ontogeny, as the animal aged, those little sawtooth bones around the edge of the frill actually resorbed and, and became part of the frill again. On the topic of the frill, it's too vertical. Like it, 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 it looks like something that was attached to the animal rather than something that grew out of the animal. It, it, it has a pretty sharp curve on Triceratops, but it, it is a natural curve coming out of the back of the skull there. Um, it, it sits pretty close against the neck unless it tilts its head down. And it was much rounder, at least in, in front view, than this is. It's got this point on the top, which is consistent with the Charles Knight painting, but is not consistent with what we know about Triceratops. And it's definitely too wide. Like, well, the whole creature is too wide. The frill seems to have been the widest point on the creature, or at least as wide as the, the thighs. But since this whole dinosaur is a little too wide, just make the frill narrower. With all this talk about horns and frills, you're probably wondering what on earth Triceratops would have used these ornaments for. Paleontologists have been wondering the same thing. The usual explanation is that it was for combat against predators and or other triceratops. It's theorized that the frill would help to protect the neck from being bitten by predators that were taller than triceratops was, where the horns would be used for charging at them. Um, there's some cool behavioral ideas that they would um, circle around their young in a large uh, uh, bison-like shiltrum to, to try and uh, uh, intimidate the predators into backing down. As far as we know, Triceratops wasn't a ceratops that lived in large herds. Um, Dr. Holtz makes the comparison that some ceratopses would have lived like moose, solitary lives, some would have lived like deer in small family groups, and some would have lived like caribou in huge herds. Triceratops seems to be the middle group. Being a social creature has implications for why it would have this big frill on its head, because Triceratops is pretty unique among the, the Chasmosaurians at least, but among Ceratopsids in general, that it doesn't have what's called fenestrated uh, frill bones. It's, it doesn't have any holes in it. It's, it's a relatively thick, solid uh, uh, mass of bone. I say relatively because when you're up against a Tyrannosaurus, which is an animal that is specifically suited to biting through bone, the frill probably doesn't pose that much of a uh, uh, obstacle. But with these big fragile frills on, on all of these dinosaurs, we figure that it was similar to the big fragile crests that show up on ornithopods, hadrosaurs, um, or to the not so fragile stuff on pachycephalosaurs. All I, what I'm getting at is it was for display. It, it would have been a identifier for I am a Triceratops, or perhaps I am a mature Triceratops who wishes to mate with you, or perhaps I am a mean Triceratops who will mess you up if you try and eat me. Similar story for the horns. Maybe it didn't need to use them that often. Maybe just having these big sharp pointy things on your face was enough to deter the other animals from trying to mess with you. What I'm trying to get at is as attractive as it is to imagine Triceratops and Tyrannosaurus sort of eternally locked in, in this battle every hour of every day, this was obviously not the case. They spent way more of their time just being animals than they would have spent uh, facing off against one another, uh, no matter how popular that is to portray in, in art and, and museum dioramas. This toy, like many, has uh, the skin textured in a, in a slightly unrealistic way. Uh, I won't give them flack for giving it these enormous uh, scales. We're supposed to call them tubercles on uh, ceratopsids and, and a lot of dinosaurs, actually. Tubercles is the word for the little geometric or round scales. They portrayed it with the uh, sort of, it looks like a padded gambeson, but it really should more resemble a brigandine. I know this because we have skin impressions from both Triceratops and from other Ceratopsids. 
And if I were to characterize what maybe sets Triceratops apart from the others, its skin is not as geometrically regular as you see in some of the centrosaurines. And while it seems to have had some areas where it had big tubercles surrounded by little tubercles, the, the big ones were only about two to three times the size of the little ones, whereas in like Chasmosaurus, you see this huge variance with these giant tubercles surrounded by little ones. Um, so, semi-regular, almost asphalt, pebbly looking surface on most of the dinosaur, and then over the back is where you usually see it restored with a somewhat regular spread of bigger scales. And maybe those were a different color than the others. We're not sure. We don't have color from any dinosaur besides the, the feathered specimen I mentioned in the feathers episode. Speaking of feathers, Cetacosaurus has one specimen that was found with these fibrous structures growing out of the tail. So you'll occasionally see restorations of Triceratops with either a full sort of tail brush in the, in the same vein as Cetacosaurus, or with almost porcupine-like quills, sometimes growing out of the actual big tubercles. There is a specimen that might support that kind of structure based on the skin impression from it, but I don't think it's been formally described at time of writing this episode, so I can't comment on that. Since this is the Triceratops episode, I would be remiss if I did not mention the myth that got uh, passed around a few years back that Triceratops never existed. That was the news story. If you read that anywhere, stop trusting that news source if you haven't already. Of course Triceratops existed. Um, the study those news stories were referencing uh, was done by Jack Horner and Scanella and, and a lot of other people. And it was really a continuation of the same work they had been doing on a lot of dinosaurs. I mentioned this in the Pachycephalosaurus episode. They looked at what's called bone histology, which is when you cut up or cut into a dinosaur bone and look at it under a microscope, you can study the structure of it. And the structure of a bone changes as an animal ages. Especially, they looked at the horn and frill of Triceratops and a similar dinosaur, dinosaur called Taurosaurus, which are found at about the same time geologically in most of the same places uh, geographically. They found that it's made of that same bone that you saw in the cranial adornments of the Pachycephalosaurus. It's this fast growing, fast healing bone that's prone to what's called remodeling uh, as the animal ages. And I've mentioned this a few times that ontogeny in Ceratopsids was kind of wacky, how the horns could change their shape as the animal grew, how the, the frill adornments could resorb. And when you see that, it's maybe not uh, unreasonable to conclude that, hey, these two animals that are so very similar might be growth stages of one another. That certainly seems reasonable for the Pachycephalosaurus stigmoloch draco rex combination. Maybe not so reasonable for Triceratops. The, the theory goes that as it aged, its frill went from small and curved and rounded with no holes to big and rectangular-ish and, and, and fenestrated is what it's called when it has windows in it. This idea is not universally accepted, however, far from it. A couple of different scientists uh, uh, published work that tried to treat that hypothesis um, as falsifiable, which is what we should always do in science. It's, it's not just inductive reasoning. We can, based on the hypothesis that Taurosaurus and Triceratops are the same animal, we can make predictions about what we would see in the fossil record based on that. And they found that we don't see those trends happening. Admittedly, the fossil record is notoriously incomplete, so that might be an artifact, but based on the available evidence, in my admittedly amateur viewpoint, the most reasonable conclusion to reach is that Triceratops and Taurosaurus were not the same creature. So, you know, spread the word. This concludes our look at Triceratops. Thank you for watching Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Please visit thegeekgroup.org to find out who you can become a member and donate. Uh, comment with dinosaurs you'd like me to have on the show. You could even send us a toy dinosaur. Our address is in the description. And we'll see you next time.
This video was made possible by a grant from the Future Girl Foundation. This video was made possible by thousands of private donations from members and viewers like you. Please visit thegeekgroup.org for more information on how you can donate and become a part of our dreams of Avalon.